Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to our frontline conversation with Mary Claire Burek, the head of the Roslyn Business Improvement District. Mary Claire, great to see you. Good morning. It's great to see you. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you're, uh, hope you're doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I, I consider myself quite lucky. Uh, I'm healthy. My family's healthy. Uh, all of our employees are healthy. Um, so it's uh, from that vantage point, although it's, it's uh, been stressful, as everyone knows, um, I, I feel quite fortunate. Well, I miss you. I haven't seen you in a bit. And with this COVID thing, we're not going to see each other for a while. We're, we're fellow classmates of the class of 2015 and upset in LGW. So it's great to- An upset. There you go. So what happened when COVID hit and everybody announced they had to leave and work from home? We, we at LGW said, okay, we'll go home for two weeks and we'll go back and be back to normal. And of course that did not happen, but uh, what yeah. was it like for you and, and everybody you work with? Yeah, I'll tell you um, in hindsight, uh, I looked really smart for having closed the office when I did, uh, which was a complete fluke. Um, we, I, I guess it was like uh, that that first week before in March, early March, before everyone, you know, the mass exodus really began. And um, I thought, you know what, I better sort of pull my employees and kind of see what the temperature is and, and just check in. And so we started having one on one meetings. We have 11 staff. And pretty quickly, it became clear that people were not comfortable. And they were, in fact, quite worried. And in fact, I had one employee who was really visibly upset in my office. And so I kind of huddled with my VP um, and we made the decision, you know what, we're gonna close. So this was on a Thursday. We really hadn't made a ton of preparations, quite frankly, um, and we decided we were closing the next day. So it was a mad scramble to kind of get everyone working, um, you know, that they could telework, get their computers up and running, make sure they had what they needed. And literally we came into the office on Friday and our IT and admin um, employee basically got everyone ready, got all the computers ready to go. Um, those of us with cars actually drove people home. So they were like carrying their monitors. It looked like it was a fire sale. Like we all had our monitors and, 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 uh, and we all left. And it was really good timing because uh, later that night we got notified by our landlord that there was a case in our building. And on Saturday we got notified that, um, that one of our employees wife had a fever. And so it was, I, I was feeling very lucky that we left when we did. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it was, uh, it was kind of fast and furious and a lot of us haven't been back since. So you all been working from home since then. What's that, what's that been like for you? So that was such an interesting challenge. We actually had a brand new employee who onboarded the Monday after the office cleared out. So she didn't even meet a lot of the people in person. Um, so it was challenging and tricky to kind of go from, because we were an office that I, I'm a big believer in culture. And I feel like the way you build culture, one of the ways you build culture is by having people together so that you have those interactions in the hallway and people can really, you know, collaborate and innovate. And um, so we really hadn't done any teleworking. That was not a policy of ours. Um, so we had to very quickly sort of stand up, you know, what were our working procedures going to be, you know, how are we going to use Teams? So Teams was brand new to us. Um, you know, like everyone else on the planet, we started using Zoom and all these other, other features. And I will tell you, I am so proud of our team. They just, they got on board and I will tell you, we were as productive, if not more productive um, in those early weeks um, of COVID, which was a surprise to me because I was concerned um, having, you know, not had the team teleworking before. I was sort of concerned about that. So as we move forward and everybody's able to come back to work at some point, are you going to keep working from home? What, what's your, what's your thought? Yeah. So that's been so interesting. And I've actually spoken to a couple of my LGW colleagues as well as other leaders, you know, kind of talking through this issue. Um, you know, I mean, I think we've, we've seen some highly publicized things about leaders who are saying like, no, you know, you're not working from home because it kills culture. Um, and I will tell you, I think we will now have an even more flexible work from home policy. Um, we actually, one of the things that we did to prepare our folks, we do have some employees that it's actually easier for them to work from the office because they have small children or they're just other distractions. They don't have good working environments at home. And so what we did was we actually went ahead and set up pretty early on what our protocol would be once we did return to the office. So we actually have a manual that talks about what people are supposed to do in terms of like, 
you know, their own personal hygiene, how we're cleaning the office, um, you know, and we basically are using our master calendar so that people sign in to say when they're going to be in the office. So we only, our sort of rule of thumb is that we only have, we have no more than five people in the office at any one time. So we kind of coordinate over Outlook. Um, and then of course our operations director has been there the whole time because we have a street team, our ambassadors, um, who have been in the neighborhood kind of caring for the neighborhood. So people have been in and out, but we haven't had sort of a full on um, return to work yet. And how did the onboarding go? I, at LGW, we found that we're doing very well working from home, that we're more productive, as you said, than we were before. We're actually doing a lot more programming. We're working harder than we ever have. But my concern has always been, that's great with the team we have, but if someone leaves and we bring in someone new, how do you inculcate them with a culture of LGW if they're not with everybody else. So how yeah. did the onboarding of the, that person go for you? Yeah, well, the good news is, is we already had a pretty strong onboarding system in place. And so I guess my best advice would be if you don't have that one, if you don't have an onboarding system in place, um, there's lots of great resources out on the internet for how to do that well. Um, what we ended up doing was we did a combination of socially distant in person with masks, um, we kind of had that employee meet people one-on-one. -on -one. So we'd come into the office for coffee, they'd get to meet. Um, and then her direct supervisor um, was working very closely with her. Um, and really it just required a lot more meetings. Um, we, Doug, same thing here. I actually found that we've been more productive and, and busier than really we've been in since I first started at the bid. Um, and so what we were able to do is um, is really almost tag team it. So um, we would have her sit via Zoom with each of the program areas so they could talk about their program and kind of onboard her. Um, and then luckily she had a pretty clear um, area of, of work. She's the one that manages our website and does our e-blast. So that was good because she had a very clear set of things that she needed that she was already responsible for. So that actually helped a lot. Um, I think it would have been a lot more challenging if it was the type of employee that didn't, you know, that that was going to kind of make their way and figure out their program area, that would have been more challenging, I think. So what's interesting to me is, is this time working from home has allowed us to be much more innovative, much more creative. We really were forced to re-examine what we did, the services we offered, the programs we offered, and say, okay, how can we add more value to our members now that everybody's at home? And we've been doing these frontline conversations, we've been doing these Leadership Today webinars, we're still going on with our member dinners, the, the, the lunch at your laptop, and all of, of course, the signature program and all of that. But it's been fascinating, it's been really exciting, I think, to be part of this change in how we're responding to our members' needs. And frankly, I think we're, we're adding more value than we ever have. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100% with that, Doug. And, and it, it's been interesting. Um, we are in a similar situation as the LGW team. We are a service organization. So we serve all the stakeholders in Roslyn that are paying the bid tax. So that's our property owners and managers, um, the residents, the businesses, the employees. Um, and so we completely reoriented what we were doing. We do over 250 events a year. And we have no earthly idea, how, like, how do you do that now in a socially distanced way? I mean, unless you put pool noodles on people's heads so that they know like how, how far away they can, they can stand. But um, it's would been you, a real would challenge. Model that, would you model that for us? You know? <laughs> I, I actually like, I saw a, a picture of that and I actually really love the idea. I think it's super <laughs> creative. Um, but we, we too have been changing. One of the things that was gangbusters for us was uh, trivia. So it has created, we created Roslyn Rivals. So we have businesses, so you've got Deloitte like pitted against Grant Thornton and like the people are loving it. Um, and, and actually the Arlington Chamber is the reigning champ so far. The, uh, the final tournament ends I think this week. So it'll be interesting to see how they do. But um, we really have pivoted like so many of our fellow classmates here we've completely pivoted the work that we're doing. We've taken our events for the most part online and in virtual format. Um, and we really had to dig deep to think about how do we support our stakeholders in this time? And, um, and it's, it looks very different than what we would sort of normally do. So let's shift a little bit and talk about reopening. That's the key word. We're seeing that across the country. We're seeing the ill effects of that through huge increase in cases. The people are very nervous about going to restaurants, going back to places, but you've got a whole reopening program 
that you put together for Rosalind. Can you talk to us about that. Yeah, so really this was born because I was in sheer panic. Um, okay, so what do we do now? So we're at home, I've gotten the team settled. It's about week, you know, going on week two, we're sort of settled in and now I'm thinking, okay, what now? Like we, we truly can't deliver most of the programming that we had budgeted and planned for. So um, through our business, luckily we have a very strong business engagement program. And so we started reaching out to our businesses and just asking them, where do you need help? What services would be helpful for you? And the most immediate thing we heard was from the restaurants. Um, they were suffering mightily. I mean, it was just, it was, it was terrible. I mean, they went from, you know, full on to nothing, absolutely nothing. So that was really the first thing that we did was we jumped into action and we created Rosalind Rewards. And so this was a program that would give 20, that would give $10 for every $20 that a customer spent um, doing carry out. We wanted to encourage the carry out. So we had a full marketing program as well as this financial um, reward that we did to try to really get people to do the restaurants. Um, and then we worked with Arlington County to set up curbs uh, pickup zone so that we could people could very easily get in and out. Um, and so a lot of our early focus was really on the restaurants. How do we shore them up during this time. And um, I know one of your earlier frontline conversations was with Kathy Hollinger of the Restaurant Association, and she has just done amazing work. And so um, we actually were taking a lot of the resources that they had, and then we were creating our own resources and really focused. So I would say the first probably three weeks um, was a full-on focus just on the restaurants, trying to figure out how to shore them up, get get people who were comfortable to, to do, do the carry out um, and the delivery options. Um, we also did a ton of press. So we were actually able to get several of our, of our restaurants like on the Sunday morning shows um, to really just generate awareness for as a community, we needed to come together and really support these restaurants in any way that we could. Um, so that was kind of like the first big piece that we did. And then we turned our attention to our businesses. Um, and that's where we um, came up with the Rouse and Ready program. We recognize that although we were still in phase zero at this point, that in order to do a wholesale support of the businesses, we were going to have to dig in deep and get going. So we started pretty early on thinking about what reentry might look like. And we contracted with Gensler um, to help create a full package for our businesses um, that really touched, and I'll, I'll go into more detail on that program, but it, it touched upon um, all the things that a business would need to think about before they could safely re-enter the workplace. Um, then we contracted with Street Sense, um, who's a very well-known retail um, consultant in our area, and, and they actually helped us put together a program for our restaurants. Um, and then finally, we brought in Bean Kinney Corman to talk about some of the legal um, things like, can you really do temperature checks? Can you ask an employee if they're sick? Can you send someone home? Um, and so to help our executives really think through the policy part of the reentry. Um, and then we did expert webinars. So, and we had a, over 300 people um, in the first week signed up um, to participate in this program. So basically by signing up, you're able to download all of uh, this little workbook that will walk you through and, and um, Chase, if you want to put it in the, the comment section or Erica can, uh, we have a link to our website. Um, normally when we spend resources, they go just to Roslyn. And in this case, we really felt that um, this is, we need to, to practice regionalism here. And so we made these resources available really to anyone. Um, and then the final part of the program was we realized that as people started to come back, they needed some visual cues to tell them that the neighborhood had been cared for and that, that it was as safe as it could be. Um, and then also reminding them um, of, of safe practices. So we did a full signage campaign um, that we, we have over a thousand signs, banners, stickers, um, building wraps, um, you know, and, and actually here's a few photographs. Um, in the upper left, you actually see we got these really cool hand wipe dispensers um, that our ambassadors put out. Um, and we tried to take kind of a light touch with the signage, you know, clean it like you mean it, um, and just really fun, fun things. Um, the ready sign on Safeway is actually shows you what six feet looks like. Um, that's, that sign is actually built to size. Um, and then on the bottom left, you see Central Place Plaza, um, and you can't see the detail on it, but there's cute little sayings on all of those, um, on each of those steps that kind of reminds people where to sit um, and, and what to do. 
Um, and then the other great thing is that we were able to work with our property owners um, to do full-scale full building signage. Um, and then here's a, an example of new banners that we put in. Um, and then we also brought the love letters um, from Virginia Tourism. And we did that for Pride Month, which was June. Um, with all of the unrest and things that were happening, we just felt it was really important to, to, to make the, the neighborhood feel good and also um, do a nod um, to diversity and inclusion. And then the, the final one, which is actually one of my favorites, this is an enormous sidewalk sticker. And it's meant to show you what six feet looks like. So it's a couch. Uh, it's two golden retrievers. Um, so, you know, there's another one that has deer antlers. So it just, it's a fun way of showing people kind of what six feet looks like. And how did you pay for all that? Did you shift your money from, in the budget, from the event you were supposed to do to now repurpose it for all this? How, how is your budget looking? Yeah, we did. So we are in sort of um, an interesting situation budgetarily. Um, while we are concerned, so the way we're funded is uh, we're a tax district. So anyone who owns commercial real property in the boundaries pays um, $100 per assessed, uh, um, 0.78 cents per $100 of assessed value. And that goes to Arlington County, which then comes to us and then we, we craft our budget. Our budget's just under 4 million. Um, and so we, um, and we disperse that budget normally, you know, um, amongst operations, marketing, um, business engagement, you know, all the services that we do. We were not able to do a lot of the services that we had planned. Events is a huge item that we do every year. As I said, we do over 250, couldn't do those. So we shifted that money um, in a couple of ways. Um, number one, to pay for this campaign. And then the other thing that we did was we partnered with Arlington County. They had a grant program that they launched, um, which um, was for any company with 50 employees or less um, that could demonstrate you know, financial hardship based on COVID. Um, and so I was really proud. Uh, we were able to contribute $100,000 um, to that grant effort. Um, and I think 19 Roslyn businesses were able to um, get grants that wouldn't have otherwise been able to get grants. Um, in the bigger pool of money that Arlington County had um, as a result of, of those efforts. So it very much has been an exercise, like many of you out there, of rethinking what do our programs look like, what are our stakeholders going to need, and then how do we budget for it? How do we start shifting budgets around, you know, sock enough away for recovery and then long-term recovery while addressing the needs of the moment? So that we were lucky, you know, I mean, organizations like LGW and the chambers, I think are, are really struggling because they're, you, you know, you're making revenue off of the programs, which helps to pay for that because we are paid through our assessments. Um, we don't have that problem, at least of now. Now, if this economic um, situation persists, um, then what could happen is our property owners would um, um, could appeal their assessments and then our budget would go down and then we would have to think about how to how to rejig or things at that point. So let's talk about where we are today. One of the things I liked and, and appreciated from the leadership in the District of Maryland, Virginia was that they were pretty much in sync all along in terms of their response when they were reopening things, you know, giving local jurisdictions some flexibility. But now Virginia has sort of gone into phase three and reopened things, and the other two jurisdictions are holding back a bit. And again, we're seeing across the country the dangers of reopening too quickly. So where are we today in Roslyn? What is happening with your restaurants? What's happening with your businesses? What are, what are the, your, your, uh, your members doing? Yeah, so I think, and I think you hit upon exactly sort of the three segments there. I'll, I'll go in reverse order. So the businesses, what we're seeing um, is a bit all over the map. You have larger companies like Nestle, which are starting their phasing now, um, which makes sense because they've had manufacturing plants that have been open this whole time. So they've really learned a lot of good lessons about, you know, how to do this safely. Then you have other, other smaller companies that are still sort of figuring it out. So we've heard everything from a uh, Labor Day restart. Um, we have a few people that are starting to trickle back into the neighborhood now. Um, but for the most part, we are seeing phasing. And we're seeing some interesting ideas with phasing. So for example, one organization told us that they are doing intact teams in the office at the same time. 
We had another group that said we would never do that because then that would wipe out if one person got sick, that would wipe out our whole HR team or, you know, that one group. So um, all sorts of creative ideas for how to start bringing people back into the office. Um, and, and again, that's why we did the resources with Gensler. Um, and, and I can talk a little bit about, about that in just a minute. But um, so that's the businesses. And then the restaurants, they're moving full steam ahead. They're, we actually, for example, Open Road is going to be opening their, um, their indoor salt. Um, that's another restaurant that they have. They're going to be opening that um, this week, um, actually today, I think for indoor. So they're starting to kind of move, move ahead um, in that regard. Um, and then I think, you know, the, the, um, and I forget what the third one was, the, we had the businesses, the restaurants. Um, anyway, um, but yeah, so they're, they're starting to, they're starting to trickle back, they're starting to come back into the neighborhood. Um, and, and I think it's going to be interesting to just see we're going to have to sort of reevaluate what we're doing out in the public realm. So a lot of what we did, um, the signage was sort of the visible piece, but a, another big part of what we did was we started shifting furniture around and all the furniture has little stickers on it. You know, please don't move me. I've been socially distanced from my neighbor. So we have, you know, um, pu public areas for people. And we're actually thinking about some outdoor workspaces that we could create um, just to give people sort of places to go. Um, and then in the meantime, our ambassador team has been trained by Hillman Consulting, um, which is a industrial hygienist. And so all the high touch areas, you know, we're continuing to clean those um, and, you know, just kind of make sure that the, the neighborhood is ready and welcoming when people come back. And how's the public responding to this? Did the public uh, take advantage of the carry out incentives for restaurants? Are they now comfortable coming and sitting inside restaurants to eat? That's so um, we were talking to Open Road the other day and they said they already have 25 reservations as soon as they announced. Um, but, you know, it's interesting when when we get a lot of email, as I'm sure you guys do, um, and we're still seeing some discomfort with the indoor. And that's why a lot of what we're going to be focusing on in this year to come is the public amenities. So how do we create really great amenities that, you know, where people can get outside, work outside, meet outside? Um, you know, so our parks and open space are going to become more important to the community than ever before. Um, and, and, you know, when you think about also, you know, inclusion and equality, which is top of our mind right now, that's another lens by which we're viewing our public realm is making sure that these areas are accessible to everyone. And so if for some reason you're in a business that perhaps, you know, hasn't, um, you know, doesn't have great social distanced areas, then you actually have somewhere to go um, when you get out into the, into the public realm. Um, and I remember the third thing that I was gonna, gonna talk about, and that's just, um, for those of you that are trying to reopen, um, again, you can download the resources, but um, I thought it was pretty clever how Gensler guided our thinking on the reopening of the workplace. Um, and they used the four Ps. So it was people, um, it was people, place, uh, policy, and perception. And so, I, and I love starting with people. And that's essentially what I did when I asked people, were we ready to bug out? Um, and we're doing a survey now to find out when are people comfortable to come back in? Because if your people are not comfortable with it and they're not ready for it, then you're going to have a tough time getting maximum productivity. So, you know, it's things like why you're returning, you know, who should return and when, what's the sequencing and the phasing of that look like? Um, and how do they feel about it? And so, you know, creating a survey to kind of think about that, I think is, is really important. And what about the place part of this? Yeah. So the place is sort of the, the second big thing. And so what we did was we used Gensler's guide, which talks about the individual workspaces. It talks about um, the collaborative areas, the cafe and the pantry, that's going to be very problematic, the coffee pot, um, which we all need. Um, you know, entry points, exit points, conference rooms. Um, and so what we did was we actually went, we did a tour through the office. And the first thing that we did was we broke apart our, what we call our bullpen area, which is where, you know, all of our people are sitting in cubes out in an open area. And we did that because we did not think it was fair to ask them to wear masks. Um, because anyone who has a, their own office can take the mask off 
when they're in the office. But if you're in a shared area or a conference room or a meeting, then the policy is, is you have to keep your mask on. And so we didn't think that was fair for the people who were sitting in a bullpen area to have to wear a mask all day. So we're going to stagger people such that they can, they, one person will be in an, a, an enclosed office at a time and we'll just rotate the days that people are in. Um, and then we turned the bullpen area, we, we put a couple of round glass tables um, where people can kind of pull their seats back and, and, um, and sort of readjust themselves. Um, the other really important thing, and there's, um, I think, some good resources that we have for this is the signage so that you're showing people what they're supposed to be doing in the office space and what the rules of engagement are. Um, so it's, it's really just looking at that physical place and thinking about how do you reorient and how do you accept visitors, you know, what do you do with, um, you know, at, at people from outside meetings. Um, so kind of thinking through all, all of those things. And the challenge you have is that the best practice, the best guidance from CDC and others is continually changing. So now we're saying that the airborne particles last a lot longer in offices with, without really good ventilation systems, that you need to be much more careful and you should wear a mask the whole time you're in the office. So adjusting to all that as they make these changes has got to be very frustrating. Yeah, and that's honestly, that was a big reason why we decided to do this program was we were hearing there was a, such an amount of overwhelm because the guidance kept changing and people just really weren't sure, you know, what was going to come next. Um, you know, interestingly, we've been having a lot of discussion, a lot of back and forth in our office about when is the right time to do public events. And actually, I would love it. Um, I would love opinions from this group. If you guys want to put it in the in the chat feature, um, Erica on my team is is on here. She can take a look. What we're debating. So normally we would do like Rosalind Cinema, Cinema, and we would. It's a you know, at, come one, come all. Show up when you want. Throw your blanket down. You know, we have a mobile bar. We have food trucks. You know, it's a party. Um, we've completely modified that. We have a lot of safety features in place, you know, with guarded, not guarded, that sounds terrible, but like monitored entry and exits. Um, we're thinking about putting Roslyn branded blankets, of course, you know me, everything has to be branded, um, putting blankets down that are spaced 10 feet apart. And so you basically sign up. And so if I'm number 40 that has signed up, um, then, I, then I'll go find my blanket. You know, we'll have an ambassador guide you to blanket number 40. And if you're up and moving around, then you have to have a mask when you're sitting on your blanket, you can just watch the movie. Um, we were talking about doing concerts on the plaza and we decided that just didn't, that didn't feel good. So um, I've been asking my board members, I've been asking Arlington County board members and trying to just get a pulse check, is August too early? So we were thinking um, late August to start, put our toe back in the water because the, the community is dying to get together you know they i mean you see this with lgw like we we want to be together we want to see each other um, and support each other and so that's our desire is to support the community but we are also really concerned about you know um, public health and safety number one what if we start a huge spike because someone comes and gets everyone sick and then number two what's the perception of that like is our, our, you know, if we do this, is there going to be some outcry like, oh, you're being irresponsible for, for encouraging people to gather? Um, and I know that the opinions are all over the map because they're even on, amongst my staff, there are some people like, oh, please, can we, can we have a movie? <laughs> like, they're just they're, like me, I'm like dying to get out of the house and see people. Um, and I personally am comfortable to do a social distance coffee um, or a walk in the neighborhood. Um, you know, I, I personally am comfortable with that, but there's people who are not. So, um, it's how do we keep the people who are not so comfortable safe. Um, so I'd, I'd love if anyone has, is willing to share their thoughts about is, is August too early? Do we wait till September? Um, that's, that's the current struggle right now. And clearly you're talking about outdoor events that people yep. think are much more comfortable being outdoor. They feel much safer being outdoor. New York City did something really interesting where in some of their smaller urban parks, they drew circles literally do yeah. line circles with a, a radius of six feet and said, okay, this is your safe spot. You can stay here and, and nobody can cross it. Here's your circle over there. And people were actually following it. They were sitting you know, out in the park and having a good time, 
but they're all within their self-contained circle. So I yeah, and I think, you know, us humans need that, those visual cues because like I know me, like when I'm, I'm seeing someone, I, I get excited and I sort of forget, wait, nope, we gotta like keep it back. And, um, and that's a lot of the signage work that we did in the neighborhood. We're, we're employing like sidewalk stickers and, um, you know, exactly as you said, like circles that denote where people should be. Um, we put planters uh, to space people out because then, I mean, because people can always ignore a sticker, but you can't sit on a planter unless you want to thorn up your butt, which I don't think you do. But anywho, I, you know, so, so I think it's about that. It's, it's, um, it's encouraging what, what people should be doing, um, you know, and, um, and trying to give them visual, visual cues about that. One thing I have noticed is it's very, very difficult for extroverts to maintain social distance. Impossible. Very difficult. They want to grab you. They want to hug you. They want to be right in your face talking to you. Like, okay, back up a little bit. We're okay. We're okay. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's so true. And, you know, and, and that's been the interesting thing I think about all of this is that, you know, at, at its heart, our organization is built to build community. Like, that's what we do. And we do that in a number of different ways um, through a number of different program areas. But that's that's when you really boil it down to the heart of the matter. That's, that's what we're doing is we're building community. And um, that just, it becomes really challenging to do in this you know, current circumstance where you can't be together and you can't gather people together. So um, that's really, I feel like gonna be our challenge. You know, and I think it's LGW's challenge. That's, that's you know, other than you know, going through the program and gaining the knowledge that you gain about the region, um, to me, that's the hallmark of the program. It's the friendships and the, and the guidance. I mean, when I feel like I'm never stumped about anything. So like if, if I can't figure something out, you know, I'll pick up the phone and I'll, I'll call Mahan, I'll call Denise, I'll call Mary Abijay. Like I'll, I have this network of people who I just feel like, you know, I can always, I can always call them. And, um, and in fact, one of the first things that I did in week one because I was really like sort of, oh my God, like, what are we even, do like, what do we do about this? I actually did a webinar with, um, with a bunch of Roslyn uh, female executives to kind of talk this through and just, and it ended up being such a wonderful um, affirmation that we need to remember to do self-care um, during these stressful times, because this has been incredibly stressful. Um, you know, and Pinky Mayfield um, participated, um, Tamika Tremelio from Deloitte. Um, we had the, the CEO of LiveSafe um, and the, the head of HR for Politico um, all participated. And it was just so wonderful to hear their suggestions and ideas for how to keep ourselves sane, you know, how to do self-care, how to care for your employees, um, you know, because for many of us leaders, this whole thing has brought out vulnerabilities and um, ways of working that we just haven't done before. And so, and that's, can be challenging, you know, cause when, when you're leading, you have this idea that, you know, you, you want to have some, you want to maintain some manner of professionalism, but at the same time, like these are your people, they're your human beings. How do you, how do you care for them in a way that, that gets them through these challenging times? And so that's, that's, what's hard about this is not being able to be in person. And um, so just thinking of creative ways to, to manage that is our challenge. So you mentioned Pinky Mayfield. Have, have there been any other LGW members that you've reached out to for help or have reached out to you? To, uh... We have, yeah. So um, several folks in our Mind Trust, um, you know, 15, enough said. Um, that's actually been a, a great resource. And, you know, um, and it's interesting because even being on this call today, like I really would welcome um, feedback on that public perception piece. Um, and it's LGW is exactly the kind of place um, to go. And, and uh, on personal matters, you know, I, I reached out to my, my buddy, Denise Hart, uh, who, you know, as I was discussing my COVID hair, uh, many of you have noticed that my picture has brown hair and I'm now the silver fox. So uh, I chatted with her about uh, whether or not to take the plunge. So that's a good thing about COVID is that uh, it can, it can, uh, allow you to step out of your, your comfort zone, even with your hair. <laughs> so any leadership lessons you've learned over the past few months? I think the one, the biggest takeaway that I would say is um, the importance of staying 
engaged and, and actively listening to your people. Um, and that requires a lot more um, attention when you're not physically there. The use of video has been terrific. I don't know how we would have done this without it, candidly. Um, but um, really deeply listening to what, because people will say one thing, but then when you look at their body language, you can see that there's something else going on. Um, one of the things that I did, and I was really nervous about this, um, you know, at, you guys did a great, um, a great frontline conversation um, um, about diversity, you know, when all the unrest was happening. Um, and it prompted me to realize that I needed to have a conversation with our, our staff about that and really collect um, how they were feeling. And so we turned a team meeting into a situation where I basically just asked how, how, how is everyone doing? And I had no idea what to expect. And there was a lot of silence in the beginning and really not a whole lot of sharing. Um, and so then I decided I would go first and I was completely unprepared. I started bawling. Um, and it was just like all this flood of emotion came out. And at first I was like really embarrassed because I was like, oh God, like here I am like bawling like a baby in, in front of my team on Zoom. And I'm a really ugly crier, it's not, not good. Um, and what ended up happening was, was really remarkable. People then who normally are more quiet, they began sharing how they were feeling about what was happening. Um, and it just really became this amazing Number one, it was cathartic for people to be able to share where they were, just like with no judgments, no conversations about what to do about it, but just where are you? Um, and number two, what that has now led to, um, um, one of my team members is actually expressed an interest in kind of taking um, a lead on a diversity and inclusion initiative for our organization. I believe we're that as a community organization, we have a responsibility to use our role and our platform. Um, and frankly, I don't know how to do that. It's not, I'm not steeped in, in that knowledge. And so my first step is to learn. Um, so I'm gonna actually be attending the LGW series. I was so excited to see that. Like, and it was all of the, the questions that were on my mind. I felt like were gonna be handled in the seven, I think it's what, seven weeks um, or seven, Six sessions, uh, yeah. one month, two hours, and for anti-racist leadership. Yeah, uh, it's gonna be a great series for America. We've got a lot of people signing up for it, so we're very excited. I'm so excited about that. Like it was, and it was just right on time because, again, there are people who are steeped in this work, and that's the beauty of the LGW community. There's a lot of you know our friends and colleagues here who are who really deeply understand this work, um, and can educate people like me who are not. And and so I want to really be able to. Um, guide my team and thinking about how do we get better, um, you know, how do we how do we apply that lens to the work that we're doing, because the public realm is for all. Um, and, and, and in fact, we were just about to go to print with our large scale banners, um, you know, the Riles and Ready, um, and we ended up adding for all. Um, at the end, because I thought that was so important to demonstrate that our community and our neighborhood is open and available for all um, and, um, you know, regardless. And so, so anyway, that's, um, I'm really excited about that series. And I think it's going to be a launching point for our team to really start to more deeply think about these, these issues. Well, I mentioned earlier about how this has forced us to be more innovative, more creative. And one of the things that I've, I've said a few times is that if we were back in the office working as we had been and all of this unrest had come up, we would have been much slower to respond because we would have said, okay, where are the speakers? Where do we hold it? Who's going to sponsor? Who's going to do this? And with our Zoom conferences, it's okay, let's just do it. Let's, we can put it together very quickly. We can do it very quickly. Let's just do it, get it done, and, and, and be much more responsive to the needs of our members as opposed to saying, okay, six months from now, we're gonna do something. Well, no, we're gonna do it very quickly. So uh, it's been very helpful for us. To, to, it's increased our ability to provide, as I said, provide those services, provide that value uh, to our members. Do you have any good, good news stories for us? There's gotta be some good news coming out of Rock. Yeah, so um, we are really excited that um, Arlington County has figured out finally, I mean, this, 
this is something that cities, you know, across the nation are dealing with. How do you do, you know, site plan review? How do you do development process um, when there's, when you can't meet? Um, and they were just not set up to handle that. And so it took a little while, but we, and actually we had to wait for the governor to clear some hurdles, um, which was a little slow in coming. But now that those hurdles have been cleared and we are cleared to use Zoom meetings to do the development process, um, we're actually moving ahead with a few um, uh, developments that are going to be coming through the, the pipeline. Um, luckily, the Holiday Inn project had just gone through, the Marriott project had just gone through, and now we've got two more um, mixed-use development um, that are actually going through the, the process now. So the good news about that is like pretty much everything was on hold. And, um, and because of we're starting to see some of these things open up, some of the, those other processes, I think, are going to gonna be able to, to move forward. One of, one of the things that I'm really excited about, and I was so bummed, um, I have been working so hard to get a temporary dog park uh, in Roslyn. And um, as a dog owner, and just we have, we have like 750 dogs in Roslyn. And so um, that has been kind of put on hold, and I'm really excited. That's now, because we can do the process online, that's going to start moving forward, too. <laughs> So who does the dog census for you then? If you got <laughs> so we actually have a super engaged group. There's this woman who lives in one of our high rises who's a dog owner and she's just taken it upon herself. She's created this uh, group called Roslyn Dogs and uh, she's, she's a fireball and she's just gone forward and she's getting petition signed. She's raising money. Um, so yeah, we're, it, it's, it's really good to, um, to have people like that that, you know, that are gonna, gonna help you do that. Mary Claire, I've really enjoyed this conversation. It's been great. And I, I got to say, I love your description of yourself as a community builder. That's how I see myself. I've spent my whole life really trying to make people proud of where they live and work. And that's exactly yeah. what you're doing. So that's why I like you so much. I hope yeah, you. thank you. Well, and of course, we're classmates, so that doesn't of hurt course. either. Of course. <laughs> so let me just give you the final word here and then and then we'll say say goodbye. For a great. So I, I you know, I think for me, one of the biggest takeaways from this whole experience, um, and it sort of echoes what you just said, Doug, um, I think when, you know, when you are, are tasked with change and innovation, um, when you're in your normal environment, that can be really challenging to do. When you are pushed and you have no other alternative, that's where change happens, that's where growth happens, and that's where innovation happens. Um, so although this has been horrible, obviously, um, I would say the one shining light in all of this is that it has pushed us to do better, to do differently, and to try things. Um, and so I'm fairly excited to see what's ahead and what innovation and what exciting ideas we come up with. And so I would encourage any of my classmates uh, or L the LGW community, if you have ideas for us on how to continue to build community in creative, fun, innovative ways, um, we're known for that. Um, we, of course, were the, the first bid to bring a mobile bar into the movies because um, I'm all about a good party and, and just having fun. So, um, but we're really rethinking, like, how do we, how do we continue to build community in this new era? Um, and I welcome any and all suggestions. And I am already grateful for those of you that I've, I've been able to bounce ideas off of and, and talk to. So I, I thank you all for that. So Mary Claire, thank you so much. Stephanie Shane from our class just gave you a big shout out. So I wanted to yeah. mention her. So anyway, thank you so much. You've given us a lot of great information. Please um, look to the links we put up in the chat room to get information on, on the Gensler Report and other things that can help businesses uh, reopen and look at some of those protocols. Thank you, Mary Claire. You have a great day. Thank you, Doug. You as well. Bye, everyone. Bye.